Hello, my name is Robert McGee and I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at SideFX. I also create foundational learning material for new Houdini artists, and today I'm going to talk about the secret language of Houdini for games. If you're new to Houdini or interested in learning how it works, then this talk will be a great introduction to concepts and ideas that you will encounter on a regular basis. If you're involved in game development, there are a whole series of concepts and ideas that you use on a regular basis. You get involved with real-time, creating cinematics, environments, texture sheets, UVs, baking, poly reduction, level of detail. There's a whole series of ideas that come up in your day-to-day -day work. Now, if you go and use a software package like Houdini, these same concepts and ideas still apply. The difference is its procedural node-based workflow adds a new layer, a new language on top of what you already know. And at first, this can seem a little foreign. I like to call it the boppity dop sop chop. There is a historical language to Houdini, and when you start to do tutorials and go out and read what other people um, are saying about it, you will encounter this strange language that may not make sense at first. But we're going to go through it here, and we'll get it cleared up, so you'll be able to take full advantage of all the material that's out there and have a full understanding of how you can learn Houdini going forward. So everything in Houdini is done with nodes. It's a procedural node-based system. And historically, these nodes in Houdini were known as operators. And this is important because of how the sort of the short form or the short name that we often give to things. These different nodes or operators come in different kinds. There's different network types, and each network type has its own flavor of node. We have surface or geometry nodes, vex or shader building nodes, render outputs, compositing nodes, dynamic nodes, task operators, look dev, and channel. Now, each of these nodes can be shortened to something that is easy to remember. And a lot of Houdini users refer to these things as SOPs, BOPs, ROPs, COPs, etc. Now, what's important to understand is that within Houdini itself, you may not see this nomenclature. When you work with geometry, it'll say geometry. When you work with images, it'll say images. But often when people, Houdini artists, talk about it, they will use this nomenclature, this SOPs, FOPs, etc., as a way of communicating to each other quickly and easily about the different parts of Houdini. So what I'd like to do now is take you through the different kinds of, of node types within Houdini so you have a better understanding of what each of these means um, and how it will affect your work creating uh, game art with Houdini. Surface operators are SOPs. This is probably the place where a lot of game developers will spend their most time in Houdini, and a lot of tools, even if they do other things, are often fed through this area. Its primary purpose is the manipulation of geometry. It also works with volumes, terrain, and height fields. You can set up your UVs here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start by looking at the nodes, the networks and the assets as three key concepts that apply not only to surface operators but to all type of operators in Houdini. But if we explore them here in SOPs, give you a good understanding of the working methodology of Houdini and, and, and how flexible and open it is uh, to create the kind of art that you want. So we're going to start with nodes and we're going to create this brick. And, and through creating the brick, we'll have a sense of how uh, the nodes work in Houdini. So here we are in the Houdini interface where we're going to go in and add a box, place it at the origin, and then we can set some parameters here up in this top bar. Now you'll notice the network view off to the side where it currently says objects and there's a single geometry object there. If we now go in and select the top faces of this uh, piece of geometry, we can now dive down to the geometry level. You'll see it says geometry in the networks. We see a box node, and now we're going to add a poly extrude node. We can use that to inset the geometry. We can now select that geometry, and we want to um, edit the points. So we're going to go in and put an edit node down, and we're going to right click and say make circle. 
So everything we've done so far, the box, the poly extrude, and the edit has created a node. Now we're adding a new poly extrude node to pull that up. And we've got the basic shape of our little brick here, our toy brick. Now we want to add a little bit more detail to this, so we're going to keep working. We're going to select the faces at the bottom, and we're going to select those and just press the Q key, which will create a repeat of that. And we're going to inset those pieces, and then we're going to press Q again. We're going to push the pieces up to create the underbelly of the brick. So we've now got a sort of a flow of data, a network that's that's creating all of these bits and pieces. And for this modeling exercise, we've created more, it's more like the construction history. We can also do things a little more procedurally. Like for instance here, we can take, we can find the edges. We want to create a group out of the edges of this geometry, but we don't want all the edges. So we're not going to use the selection we just made. What we're going to do instead is we're going to say, give me everything with an angle between 89 and 91. And this will create, basically select all the right angles that we have here, which are exactly the edges we want to use to create our bevel. This is neat because even if we change the shape um, to something different, we'll always get all the right angles that we want uh, for our bevel. Now as we go and apply the bevel, uh, you'll see that it's only being applied to the bevel edges from that group and we can get the look that we want. Now every node in Houdini comes with a parameter pane and specific parameters associated with that node. And if you make changes uh, there, you'll see the results that you need in this view. If we go back to the object level, we can rename that. We're not dealing with uh, sort of hides all the other nodes inside of it. There's a lot of nested no nodes within other nodes within Houdini and geometry nodes tend to be inside objects. Uh, now we can take this and we'll just do a subdivision display on that um, just to get a feeling of what the brick looks like. So now you've got your first sense of what it's like to use nodes in Houdini, manipulate both in the viewport and the network view, and get the result that you're looking for. Now the next thing we'd like to do is talk about the networks themselves, the flow of data that can create very interesting opportunities. In this case, what we want to do is take a piece of geometry like this rubber toy and we want to use our bricks to create a brickified version of it. So we're going to find points within that surface and use those points to instance bricks to it. Now this is a fairly easy process at first. All we need to do is take the rubber toy uh, test geometry we have. There's a number of test geometry objects available in Houdini for exploration when you're first learning it. We're going to change its scale and its position. And we'll be able to just go to a four view here and just adjust those views to get a sense of where the object is. And now what we're going to do is we want to fill this object with points. So in Houdini, we have a node for that. Uh, we simply right click on the output here and we go points from volume and we place that down and we display that here. Now that will just put points within this, this object. You can hardly see them right here, but if we go in and we select them all, uh, the highlight in yellow, and you can see there's all the points inside the volume that we can use to copy the bricks to. And that's essentially what we're going to do. Now if we go back up here, we'll just let's rename that to rubber toy. We've now got two objects, one with the network with the brick and the other with the uh, points. We want to combine these so we can work with them together. So one way to do this is to select the two objects and going up to the modify shelf here uh, we can click combine. Combine will bring those together and now we've got two different networks sort of combined together with a merge although we're going to combine them a little differently so we're going to delete that merge. Now we see the single brick. We can now use a, a tool called copy to points and that will allow us to pack an instance. So instance all the bricks to a bunch of points we put in the second input. Now, when we first do this, it doesn't quite look right. And part of the reason for that is our volume, 
we used a, a grid of 0.1, whereas I think the, the bricks are 0.2. There we go. That gives us more of what we're looking for. Now, this is not being displayed quite right, so let's go in and um, if we look at optimize. We can just avoid some of the culling there um, and add more polygon limit, and that will allow us to see them all. There we go. So now we can see our our bricks being assigned as instance objects to all the points. Now, if you do a lot of video game stuff, the idea of instancing stuff to points sounds very familiar. And as a matter of fact, will be the basis of a lot of things you might do in Houdini when you're doing building up levels and creating things later on. And we're going to explore that uh, with more other kinds of examples a little bit later. Uh, for now, let's just follow this one through. Uh, because there's lots of interesting possibilities that these nodes and networks at the geometry or SOP level give us, we want to take advantage of them. So here we have, uh, we put the single brick into a network box and collapsed it just so we don't have to see all those nodes because we're, we're um, they're still there in the network, but they're just vis visually, visually hidden. Uh, and there we see our simple network. Now what we'd like to do is add some color. So we're going to put color onto the points and then those colors will actually be picked up um, by the bricks themselves in the viewport here. That's one of the concepts and ideas that, that, that happens in Houdini a lot, where you assign attributes to points. Those attributes can then be used for certain purposes down the line. Um, in this case, just simply to assign color. Now, it turns out that those aren't being picked up when it comes to rendering, um, but that can be easily fixed uh, using a material. So we can assign a material with the, the color instead, and that material can have, um, have the color that we need. So we're just going to go and put a principled material down here. Um, we'll call it the brick material. And we don't need to add color to it because in actual fact, um, we're still going to pick the color up from the points. Uh, the difference is that there's an option on the material to, to pick it up for the render. Um, so first we need to just assign that brick material. And at first it doesn't really change anything, but all we need to do is go back to the material in the material palette, and there's an option there that will say, because we've instanced, packed and instanced uh, these points, um, the render expects that point color information to come a different way. So there's a use packed color option there. First, we're going to lighten the base color, uh, and then we're going to click use packed color, and that will solve the problem right there. There we go. So now we've got that rendering. Now, this is important to understand because when you do something in Houdini, you're going to go, you might not go to a render, you might go to a game engine, um, but understanding how the attributes within Houdini will then be read by that render engine down the line is an important uh, thing to understand. So in this case here, uh, we made the adjustments necessary. So the next thing we want to do is test whether our system, how robust our system is. So we're adding a switch node in, and we're going to bring in another object. In this case, we're going to bring in a platonic solid. We're going to take that, and we're going to make that in a little bigger. Uh, and we don't want a tetrahedron. Let's go with a Utah teapot and maybe raise that up a little bit. So it's about the same size as the rubber toy. Uh, and let's see whether our network can adjust to a different kind of input. So if we go to the switch node, uh, we can change that from 0 to 1. And now we are brickifying the teapot as opposed to the geometry. So this is one of the things exciting about Houdini is that this network is always alive. There's always a flow of data. And because of that, you can feed different things into it and have that, that and steer that flow of data off in a different direction. So now that we have that, um, we want to get a better color. Instead of it just being red, we want to go in and say, well, you know what? There was originally a texture map that was assigned to this object. And we'd like to take advantage of that texture map uh, in coloring this network so that it looks, it's a brickified version of the original geometry with its texture map. So in order to do that, we just keep adding to the network. And this is what's exciting about the, the, the Houdini flow is that you can keep adding, trying something, exploring, and, and this is what geometry nodes and SOP nodes really do for you. 
So in this case, we're going to put down what's called an attribute VOP. Now this is interesting because we're going to actually interface with a different network type. So in this case, we're going to double click in, and this is a different thing called VEX Builder. So this is VOPs. So we were in SOPs, now we're in VOPs. And so this is where those network changes can sometimes happen. So in the case, we're doing a simple thing. We're just going to apply a texture map to the color uh, of the geometry. So we're going to set some UVs, set up a texture, and feed that in. And then we're going to take the texture map and promote that up as a parameter um, so we can make changes to that up at the other level. And we're just going to label that texture map just because that'll be easier to understand um, when we're working with it. So now we've got that. And now if we want to, we can feed that in place of the color. But it's not going to work unless we promote that parameter from a well, it's a color parameter and it comes from a vertex and we have to put it on the points because it's colors assigned to the vertices but we need them as point point colors so we're promoting it then we're going to take that and we're going to transfer that uh, to the geometry so if you look at the points and then we're going to attribute transfer the color to the points and as you can see that's giving us uh, definitely some of the colors we're looking for. Now we're going to put another switch node down that will allow us to switch between the red color and our new um, texture mapped color. And we'll just call that texture swap or texture switch. And if we select that node, we can go from zero to one and you'll see now we've got colored so we've got the default texture assigned to there. But of course, that wasn't the texture we're looking for. We needed another one. So we're going to go down to the texture that we originally had, accept that, and boom. Now we've got the original model colors now applied uh, to the brick colors, therefore giving us uh, a brickified version of the model, both shape and texture. And all of that was just by manipulating and flowing the various parts of this network um, through. So the next thing we'd like to do is make an asset out of this. These networks are really useful. They solve a problem. In this case, we've solved the problem of turning one object into a brickified version of itself. But what if I want to share that? I want other people on my team, other people within my studio to take advantage of that tool. So this is where the networks within Houdini, down here at the SOP level, can do some interesting things. We take that, collapse it into a single node, which now functions as a tool, and that tool can be shared. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we select all the nodes that we're working with, and we can take them and collapse them into a digital asset. So you'll notice that in the 3D view, we now have a single node And that single node can now be called Brickify. And we're going to put that into the digital asset directory and accept. So this digital asset will be a file on disk that it contains all the nodes that we just created and allows them to be imported back into Houdini and used as a tool. This tool will be like an equal partner in Houdini, just like all the other tools in Houdini. And as a matter of fact, a lot of tools that SideFX delivers within Houdini are actually digital assets. Um, and so that's an important thing to understand. So now we get this Brickify asset, and now we want to build an interface for it, something, a way for people to work with this tool um, without having to dive down and touch all the nodes inside. So what we can do is take this parameter section of the digital asset here and start promoting parameters up. So for instance, we're going to promote um, this thing called select input. Now if we right click on here and we say, uh, show me the parameters, you'll see there is a thing called select input that's been promoted to the Brickify tool. And if we just go down here, you'll see that we can switch between this input and that input. So there we go.
we built our first parameter on the asset. Now notice that we haven't done this by writing scripts or writing code. This is done just by clicking and dragging and, and setting up here. What that means is that your technical directors, your artists, they can be building their own tools using this methodology. It's pretty exciting there. We're going to change this as well from a, a, a slider uh, to a menu so that we only focus on the two op options we have. So zero is the rubber toy and one is custom shape. And if we press uh, apply there, you'll see that that updates uh, on the Brickify uh, node there. And we can say custom shape and rubber toy. Perfect. Okay, so now we've gone and we've taken this network and we're starting to make it into a tool. We can take the second input we have, the texture one, and we can do pretty much exactly the same thing. Just give it a proper name, because if we don't give it a, a proper name, then it's not going to be useful to people. So we're going to go, you can either use a color look or one would be a texture map look. So we've got that as an option. Apply, and there we go. So do we want the color or do we want the texture map? So all of this is being built by hand using the nodes and networks that we have here. Then we can say, well, what other parameters do we want? Well, we maybe we don't want red, so let's promote that color up so somebody can make that change. And back there on the attribute VOP, we had this texture map. So we're going to promote that up as a parameter so people can pick their own textures instead of having to use the one that we have as the default. Now we're actually going to go into here and we're going to just change the default to Mandrill. Mandrill is a is a an image that actually ships with Houdini, so it, Houdini can always find it. Um, and that'll be a better as a, as a default. And there we go. And now we look at this and we see we promoted all these parameters uh, and starting to build our own tool. Now, it doesn't have to stop there. There are lots of things we can do to really enhance this network, give it more functionality, and get it to do what we want to do. But before we do that, Let's test it. Let's see whether our tool is actually doing what we want. So we're going to add a second object in, in this case, um, another piece of test geometry. And we're going to move it off to the side. And we're going to dive in and sort of resize it. So let's just make that a little bigger. So the question is, we've put a, a digital asset on disk, and we want to see whether that can be applied to this object similar to we did to the original one. So there's the Brickify node. So this is a different instantiation of the Brickify tool, although both of them are referencing what's happening on disk. So we can make changes to what's on disk. Both of the instantiations will benefit. And then we can take the Brickify and we can point that to that other texture map. And there we go. So now we've got the proper color on there that suits that particular object. So as you can see, you can use a tool many, many times, but each version of the tool can be doing its own thing, can be applied in its own way. It's a very powerful um, capability that assets have. And it's all at the, at the fingertips of an artist or, or a TD uh, working with Houdini. So now that we have this, um, we might want to add other functionality. Keep it going. Keep keep adding some things in. Now, what we're adding here might not be ideal for a game engine down the line, uh, but it might be more useful within a Houdini environment. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll just do this, and then we'll we'll talk about the game engine side of it in a little bit. So we're going to go in and create a group, and we're going to call this group by range. And the goal here is what we want to do is we want to start picking bricks and getting rid of some of the bricks based on their point numbers. So we're going to take the points and we're going to do a thing called start and length. And we're going to create a length that is tied to uh, the current frame. So the current frame minus one, and we're just going to multiply that by 20. And because of this, we will select points uh, we're going to invert the range. We're going to select points as time goes forward. Now, that's not really going to help us as is. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another node in, a blast node, that's going to say get rid of 
um, all the points in that group. So give me all the points from there. Now currently it's all the points, uh, but let's look at that and see how as we play forward, those points grow up. Now they're growing up in a weird order. We don't seem to have control over the order, uh, so we can fix that. Uh, but that's just a matter of adding another node into the flow of data. So let's just move these down. We're gonna add in what's called a sort node. And the sort node will allow us to organize the points based on, in this case, uh, a vector. So we're gonna point the vector up. And so now you'll see the fl it flows from the bottom up. So it's a little more organized. Now we can go in and copy to points. And if we go back and play forward again, you see that we're actually building the bricks up from the ground. So this is another bit of functionality we've added into this tool. Now, like I said, we might want that functionality, we might not. So just like we did with other aspects of this tool, we're gonna add a switch node in. And the switch node will allow us to say, do I wanna just bring this in, what well, we'll call it animation switch. Do I wanna bring in everything before we did the animation and then everything after? And then we'll feed that into the copy to points there. So by default, when it's set to zero, there's no animation. And that might be more suitable for a game engine. But if I'm in another application, like Houdini or Maya, well, maybe I want the animation. So that's an option there. And of course, what we would want to do is in order for that to be useful, uh, we would want to add that to the tool, go back to the parameter pane and say, you know what, uh, let's take that parameter and add that in. Now, just to help organize things, let's bring a, we can bring what's called a separator, uh, just to sort of design and organize what's going on in there. Uh, and now we're gonna go in and drag that down to the bottom there. And we'll call this, uh, give this a special name, animation, animate bricks, animate bricks. And in this case, what we're gonna do is we're going to change that into a um, toggle. And we're gonna make the default to zero and uh, apply. And then we're also, uh, we were animating based on the number 20 and 20 might not be the right number in all cases. So now we're just gonna add a, a sort of an extra parameter into the interface here. And then we'll show you how that parameter can be used inside our expression uh, to control the speed of the animation um, because of the multiplier we have against time. So we're gonna go from a range from let's say one to 20 and we just press accept. We're gonna lock it at the base, but not above. So we can go higher than 20, but we can't go lower than one and accept. Now, currently that parameter is not doing anything. But if we go to this group range here, instead of the 20, we can type in uh, channel reference and we're basically gonna go up and find build speed. There it is right there, enter. And then that will allow us to use that number to control what we're doing. And if we save the asset Brickify, and then we're gonna lock the asset. Locking the asset means an artist can't touch what's going on inside. So when I've handed this to someone else, the inside should probably be locked so they only work with the top level. Now, this isn't going very fast, so we're gonna change the build speed to let's say 20. And there we go, we're building it up. So we've added that functionality, all of this using the SOP nodes inside Houdini wrapped up into a digital asset. If we go back over to our squab, let's see if that same idea carries forward there. We can animate the bricks. Now it's going very slow there because there's lots of bricks in this one. So we're gonna change that speed to let's say 100. And there we go, builds much faster. The last thing we did was we created nodes, networks, and then assets, all at the SOP level. But what if we wanna use this capability within other applications? Now the way it works is, let's just overview what we've done so far. We had a network, it's created the Brickify. We collapsed that into a single node. We built parameters for it so we could make choices up above. And then we imported that into our Houdini scene and used that high level interface to manipulate the results. So if we now wanna go 
and use that in other applications. So we go and say, well, what if we want to use that in here? Well, normally that wouldn't make any sense. How could that make any sense? The way it does is we have something called Houdini Engine. So when a Houdini Digital Asset is opened in those host applications, Houdini Engine plugin will take that asset and go off and cook the nodes inside the asset using the Houdini libraries and then give the results back to the host application. If you manipulate the interface, the interface that we built in Houdini, which becomes available to you in the host application, then it recooks the nodes, gives you a new result, gives it up to the host application. This is how Houdini Engine works. And we can take a quick look at that inside, in this case, Maya. So we're going to load an asset. The plugin's already been loaded and ready to go. And there we go. We now see our Brickify tool inside the Maya environment. Now, you'll see that not only do we see the bricks, I mean, this is how if I imported it with some other format like Alembic, I, I could see the same thing. But you'll notice on the side, I'm actually getting all the controls that we had available before. So I have the animate bricks capability. And if I move through the slider, you'll see that animation ability I had in Houdini is in here as well. And it's cooking Houdini under the surface while it delivers the results to me here. Now, what we can do though, is we can change our object that we're referencing. So we're gonna, instead of using the rubber toy, let's set our selection to this model here. And we're gonna create that as a custom shape. And there we go. Now we've got that there. Now let's just hide the Rhino uh, by turning off its visibility. And now we have a brickified version of that sculpture um, here in Maya. So what's important is, this tool that I built in Houdini is now a tool available to artists inside this other host application. Now, if we're inside a game engine, what would we do there? Well, again, we can bring that exact same tool, the Brickify tool in, and here we have it in this environment. Now, because we used instancing and packing, um, it's fairly efficient in how it does this, although I may want to optimize the brick a little bit more if I was putting it in a game engine. Um, this is a good starting point. Now, I can bring that in as an object like that, or I can bring it in and say, again, let's do a custom object. So I change to a custom shape, and then inside this environment, I can say, the Unreal environment, I can say, go and get me, pick things from the Outliner view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over and find this walkway and select all the pieces of the walkway and say, use selection. Once I do that, I've brickified that. Now let's hide those things here, and there's the brickified version of the steps. So I can take objects within my engine environment, and I can make them part of my gameplay. Now the animated part of the asset wouldn't work in here, because the asset will not be around during gameplay. It's available within the editor, but, it's not, but only the end results are available once you go into gameplay. So it's important to understand this isn't a runtime solution, but it is a tool available for game editors uh, to bring assets in and do some pretty amazing things. So here we've taken an asset, built it from scratch, everything. Built the brick, built the network, built the Brickify tool, saved it as a digital asset, and made it available here in a game engine. So... Here's another example. This one is uh, part of a tutorial series we have available on sideeffects.com uh, where taking an input curve, you can build a level, a whole game level. So as you move points on the game, uh, so here we're in Unity right now, uh, we can edit the points on that, grab one of those points, and as we move it, you'll see that it actually modifies uh, what's going on with the level underneath. And you can get down and, and take a look at that and see. Now, what's important about this example, and how does this relate, for instance, to the Brickify tool, is that at one level, they're very much the same. You create a bunch of points, and those points are actually used to place geometry. The Brickify tool, we, we place a single brick. In this case, we're going to position all these different elements, corners, panels, doors, etc. In the case of this level, um, there's a little bit more logic and intelligence behind which object gets placed where, 
um, whereas in the brick case, every everything every point got a brick. Um, but here, different pieces are going to go in different places uh, based on logic. So here we have different panels. They're in sort of, sort of a grid pattern, and we'll be taking advantage of those. And all of that uses methodologies that are that are really just enhanced versions of what we did with the Brickify. And this, like I said, this is a tutorial series that we have available on our website. Uh, and also Simon, uh, who created this, he also did a presentation earlier today, which you can see online later, uh, where he overviews this whole process, uh, this process and, and where all of this comes from. Um, in this case here, we've got these special panels that uh, create variation. I mean, the, the key about all this is that, that this example shows you that you don't just, instead of a single brick that just looks the same in every instance, you can start to, by applying information, attributes to the points, start to get variation in terms of the look and the feel and what's going on as these things get copied around. So this panel over here and the panels there don't look exactly the same. But they are still controlled because it's a digital asset by things that, that are available within the asset. So if you want to rotate the pieces, there's a parameter for that. If you want to change the way they, they look and feel, um, there are parameters for that and they can be manipulated here. Within the SOP level, there are many other things that you can do. We talked about some of the others. One important one that could be very powerful for gamers is the fact that there are nodes for doing height fields, ultimately, and therefore terrains. Um, and those terrains can have instance points for trees and foliage and other things. Uh, also, that kind of thing can be sent over to a game engine. So the height fields from Houdini, you can wrap a digital asset and have, the, have them pop up uh, in the game engine as well as part of a digital asset. There's also a set of other tools called Side Effects Labs. Um, these are tools which are created by TDs at Side Effects Software uh, specifically to solve issues that artists and game artists specifically deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so there can be things like mesh processing, world building, integrations with other applications like OpenStreetMap or, or texture sheets, normal maps, all sorts of things are available. These are not part of the install of Houdini, they actually sit separate, but if you click on that update toolset button, you'll get them all populated within your scene. And these are important because uh, they really do solve day-to-day -day problems that artists encounter, and game artists um, specifically, uh, a lot of these tools are geared towards them. Here's an example of one that does um, Mapbox. So it brings in some terrain, uh, brings in this area here where we get roads, we can get buildings, we can bring all those things together. Um, these tools are really designed to streamline workflows and, and make things work faster and easier for people. Now, we spoke earlier about uh, VOPs. We actually dove down and we texture mapped the, the bricks using VOPs. Uh, VOPs is primarily used in Houdini for shader building using the VEX uh, vector expression language, uh, but it can also manipulate geometry. It can be used at the compositing level. It can be used in many different places. And so there's nodes that allow you to wire things together to uh, create materials like this, uh, or you can, um, manipulate geometry using this as well. Render operators. There's actually a whole context just for output nodes. Render outputs, geometry outputs, uh, things like texture baking. Um, so here's some example of some of those that are available. There's the mantra for rendering geometry node. Uh, there's HQ for distributed renderings and simulations. Um, and then the, all the ones on, on the other side are actually from side effects labs. There are a whole bunch of those nodes are actually available at the ROP level, uh, render operator liberal. Uh, so that you can go to Marmoset, you can go uh, 3D Facebook, Sketchfab. Uh, you have specific nodes for doing RBD to FBX. You get little bones so that you can get your simulations in your game engine properly. Imposter textures, texture sheets. So a whole series of options uh, are available within this environment here. And uh, so that's an important one to be aware of. Cops, compositing. So if you were obviously, if you were animating or doing cinematics, uh, you might want to do some compositing at the end of the chain to, to spruce up your images. And Houdini can certainly do those kinds of comps, uh, control color, masks, other effects. Uh, but it also can be used to feed in textures. Uh, so here's an example of an image brought in, it's saturated, converted to a normal map, 
and then the normal levels are controlled. Maybe this is pumped back as a texture map uh, into a scene or onto a digital asset. So there are things that can be done in COPS that are supporting the texture workflow um, in addition to compositing things sort of after the fact. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a plug plugin for Substance where you can bring in a Substance and manipulate that, and that plugin actually works within this environment. Now, for DOPS, Dynamic Operators, Houdini is actually very well known for its visual effects capabilities, and DOPS is where a lot of that happens, with solvers, forces, and collisions all manipulated within this environment. Uh, Pyrofex, Bullet RBD, Fluids, Cloth, Hair Fur, and soft body. These are the kinds of things that can be done within the DOPS environment. Now, what's important to understand is many of these things are designed to be rendered. And if you want to use them for your visual effects in games, then they have to be converted over into something, something that's understandable by the game engine. Uh, and there are a number of tools to help with that, some of them in Side Effects Labs, uh, like the RBD to FBX that we talked about. Um, the other thing that's important to understand is that not all of these dynamics has to happen at the DOP level. There are there there's a, a new SOP based workflow for doing a lot of work in Houdini where you can do an RBD bullet right in SOPs, for instance. Now the the magic is of course that inside there is a DOP inside that SOP because Houdini can nest these things one inside the other inside the other. Uh, but from an artist's point of view, they're able to do a lot right there in SOPs, um, not realizing that they're actually using a DOP network somewhere within that chain. It's a little hidden. So here's an example of something, uh, just a simple simulation. Uh, this needs to go out to a game engine. Um, so there is a game dev or a side effects labs tool for creating um, vertex animation textures. So this will therefore be converted in a way uh, that it can be brought in and used within a game engine environment. So anything that's done in the sort of dynamics uh, or visual effects side uh, usually requires some sort of conversion to be accepted within a, a game engine environment. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is TOPS or task operators. These nodes are quite unique um, because they allow you to take the networks within Houdini and instead of wrapping them up into a neat little package, instead you sort of blow them up and send them all over uh, your compute farm uh, or your cloud uh, to distribute tasks, manage dependencies, and do some pretty amazing things. So let's take a quick look at, at how this works. So if you have a node, one of these top nodes within Houdini, and you tell it to go do something, what it does is the first thing it does is say, well, it breaks down how many tasks it thinks needs to be done. It says, okay, I need to do those tasks. Then it goes and talks to a scheduler. In this case, this is a local scheduler. So these each of these little blades represent a core on my machine. And at first it decides and says, you know what, I'm going to take three of those and I'm going to utilize those. And it starts processing through. So you look at the node and it says seven tasks are complete, three are on the go, and seven are in the queue waiting to go. So that's great, not very fast. So what you do instead is you say, well, let's go to the farm or the cloud. Now we got a whole bunch of blades. As a matter of fact, we've got 54 on the go. We're now gonna maybe use a scheduler like Deadline. Um, you can still use HQ, Deadline, and it's gonna distribute those tasks. It's gonna take each of those little dots and take those out as a task to the farm and then spit the results back. When they finish, they get labeled green. And when you're finished, all done. The tasks are done. Well, let's see what this, this workflow looks like because this, this sounds different than other parts of Houdini. Um, so we're gonna take a task that actually relates back to the Brickify tool that we worked with earlier. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, there's the local scheduler, because we're not going to work on the farm for this one. We're going to start by creating a file pattern. And we're going to go and say, go pick up some files on disk. So we're going to look at, there's about four files on disk. And we're just going to put a star here, because we, we just want to pick them all up. We don't want to pick up just one of them. We want to get them all. So we go through there and we say, cook that selected network. And we get four options. And if you click on them, you'll see the four different models that were in that directory are all being picked up by this top node. So it was able to go through and, and do create four separate tasks, go do those tasks, and spit out the result. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to put down the HDA processor node. And in this case, we can go get that Brickify node we created earlier. 
and we can use that here within the Dynamics environment. Now if we go and cook that, now if we have to do a couple things first. We, we're going to use a custom shape and we're going to use the nodes above as inputs and now we can go through and cook it and now what we're going to do is we're going to click on those four things and we're going to see that we've actually brickified each, four, each of those particular pieces of geometry. So instead of me having to do them one by one by one, we've got a, a network environment here where it can do a whole bunch of them at the same time by taking advantage of different nodes and so on on the farm. Now, we also noticed that we used to have, we have texture maps that are associated with all of these. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a little bit more here. We're gonna bring in the different texture maps that are associated with this. So each one of these has a texture map. So like for instance, the third one or the second one is the pig texture map. And we want to feed these things so that they're all coming in together. So we're going to put down a node for collecting them. So petition by node. We're going to feed the two nodes in. And when we cook this node, what we're going to see is, let's just set up a couple parameters here, do an input order, and then cook. When we go to cook this, now we're going to see, it looks, looks like the four pieces of geometry, like, like didn't even brickify them yet. Um, but if you click on it, you'll see that they've now con collected both the geometry and the texture file together. And now we can use that in this node here. Now, so we first we recook it, um, the HD processor, and we go and say, did this work? And of course, it didn't work yet. The reason it didn't work yet is because we need to tell it to pick up the texture map. So it's picking up the geometry automatically, but it's not picking up the, the texture map. So what we do here is we can type in here um, to say, get me at PDG input dot one. So dot zero is the geometry, dot one is the texture map. And because of that, we can now go and dirty and cook this and you'll see all the different tasks going off and doing their thing, and we're told when it's finished, and there we go. Each one of these has texture maps that are appropriate uh, to its look. So that's perfect. That's exactly what we were looking for. Now, the thing is, if I'm going to do a whole bunch of these, I might want to evaluate whether I like the results or not. So one option here would be to render it, to say, well, let's take the end results, let's render them out. So we go over to here, and we see that we've got, um, this will show me the end results. Uh, we got a ground surface, we got a camera, an environment light, um, and then we can just look through the camera. So that's basically what it's going to give us. And if we were to just let's make sure we've got the in we're going to use the index of each of the um, of the uh, of the objects to help us identify them. Uh, so we name the images one, two, three, four, uh, and we're going to just create JPEGs out of that. And we can cook this, and now when we cook this, what we're going to get is we're going to get four images of each of the different objects brickified. And this is something I could pass on to a supervisor and say, "What do you, do you like? How this turned out?" Um, you know, and um, then you can make evaluations. Okay, maybe there's too many bricks. Maybe there's not enough bricks. Maybe the geometry needs to be smaller. Now, of course, what we can also do is we can take this particular object, feed it into uh, another node, collect the four images together, and feed them into, let's say, an image magic node. And the image magic node will allow us to create a mosaic of those four solutions. So now, instead of me sending a bunch of different images to my supervisor, I can just send them one image and say, check them all out, tell me which ones you like, and we'll sort of move forward uh, based on that. And of course, What's nice about this is we did this on a local with four images. What if we had 12 images or 12 models? Create a mosaic out of that. What if we have more? What if we have more? Well, this is where suddenly the farm and the cloud can be brought into the picture by using a scheduler that goes off and distributes these things appropriately to the larger compute farm. So you can get a lot done in a very short time using these task operators or top networks. So these are a very important sort of next step in, in working with Houdini and its procedural nature. Now, there's a tutorial on our website for building this city. 
uh, where you actually build the city using uh, PDG to build the different buildings, find the different lots. Uh, so you input a map and the map allows you to make the city. What's neat is I'm going to skip ahead to the end of the tutorial, past the tutorial, and say I've made a digital asset and in that digital asset is a PDG network. So we're taking advantage of PDG inside a digital asset which is going to run side inside a host application, in this case, Unity. So this is where we're getting a whole bunch of Houdini concepts all wrapped into one. We got a network of SOPs um, feeding into a into a digital asset that then feeding into a PDG network. And now we've got an interface inside our game editor here for managing that PDG as we go and cook it. Now this interface exists within our Unity plugin, our Unity engine plugin. Uh, it will be available in our Unreal plugin later this year. Uh, it's not in there quite yet. But if we go and we go to cook this, it's going to go through and it's going to build all the buildings based on a, a, an initial map that we had uh, and deliver them here within the scene. And so again, this is currently being distributed locally, but it could also have, if this was a bigger city, it could be distributed off to a farm and the end results brought into here. Um, and then if we open that, we see here's a new map and it just quickly updates, goes off and does its processing and brings the results back. So very powerful tool. And again, not runtime, but certainly for working within an editor and getting creative decisions made while you're in the editor uh, with your art, uh, very powerful tool. And we can also change the center where the, the buildings are highest and that will update quickly as well. Now, another big thing about top networks or PDG is it's PDG stands for proce procedural dependency graph. And what that means is that notice as I go to move this here, there's a whole bunch of bits and pieces in the scene and only this bottom corner is getting updated. The reason is because a PDG network is smart enough to when you make a change is to figure out what is affected by that change. And it doesn't try to update the dots that aren't affected. It only updates the dots and therefore the, the, the geometry that is being affected by the change that you make. So it's very important um, if you set your PDG network up correctly uh, that you can work much faster and more efficiently because you're not constantly redoing a whole complete network every time you make one tiny little change and have to wait for everything to update. So PDG offers some really powerful capabilities there. So next we're going to talk about LOPs. It's a new conduct within Houdini. Uh, it stands for Lighting or Look Dev Operators. Uh, and what's unique about this environment is it's built on a foundation of USD. Now for game artists though, USD is starting to, to become a buzzword and, and, and game engines are starting to support it. And this is an environment that could easily be used for layout and setting up levels for your game. It's not quite there yet. We've got a lot of optimizations and things to do uh, to be really game ready, but it is good to be aware of this context and the fact that it will become uh, a part of the game workflow down the line. And USD is at the core of it. And this is the part where game engines are going to be supporting this USD. So it's important to be able to understand what this can do for you. On the layout front, um, we've got some interesting tools uh, within this environment where we're trying to do physically based uh, manipulation and layout of objects. Uh, and this, of course, could be used for level design as well. Again, at its infancy, uh, but it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. So we just grab a bunch of objects and just take all these objects and they're designed using the physics engine in, in Houdini. They're designed to just sort of, you know, uh, work and connect and you don't have to worry about objects passing through other objects. You just have them all sort of functioning and working together. So the last uh, context within Houdini we're going to talk about is CHOPS. Uh, CHOPS is for channel operators, which is primarily for motion and kinematics. Uh, and probably one of the biggest things you might encounter it with in Houdini now is if you happen to build characters within Houdini, um, your inverse kinematics uh, and any kinematics you set up will be running through CHOPS as you set your characters up before they get output. Um, so that's just uh, where it is there, but it's also good at, at processing motion data and doing a whole bunch of other things, more sophisticated things that we, we don't need to get into right here. So CHOPS is about motion. Now, one of the other things um, that we have in Houdini that I think is worth exploring is parameters, channels, and attributes. Just from a from a language point of view, a lot of people refer to what what Houdini calls parameters. Other applications call attributes. 
Um, so when you get parameters that are associated with nodes, uh, those are called parameters. Uh, channels are when it's been once it's been animated or keyframed, the parameter becomes a channel and is available for animation. And attributes, like we saw earlier, are something a little bit different. They're something you assign to things, um, and they sort of flow through the network. So in this case, we have prim number. So there's a primitive number on this object, and that would carry through the network and potentially be used for something else. Uh, sometimes this is often referred to as blind data, uh, and it could be used for level building for a whole bunch of different tasks. So it's important to understand that in Houdini, parameters, channels, and attributes are a little bit different. Um, just wanted to review that quickly because I think it does apply. Uh, and then we talked about VEX before through VOPS, the vector uh, VEX operators. Uh, there's also a language uh, VEX that you can use as a scripting language. Uh, and there are nodes, special nodes called Wrangle nodes, where you can write that. Um, there's also Wrangle nodes for Python and other things as well. Um, but it's, it's just something that you will encounter. Wrangle node, wrangle is a word that'll come a lot in, up a lot in tutorials and so on that you work with. And, and some people, many of the things that you can do in a wrangle node, you can do in, a, in an existing Houdini node, uh, but some people just feel more comfortable doing it uh, by scripting. It's just where, the, especially in the game dev world, a lot of people just feel more comfortable with that. So wrangle nodes are something you will encounter. So I'd like to finish up here by just helping you understand uh, a couple things about Houdini products that are available. Um, Houdini Effects is our flagship product, and it basically includes all the different node types that we've spoken about, uh, from surface operators to task operators, all the way through. Uh, and this product... Um, you know, is available for commercial use. We have a second commercial package called Houdini Core, and it's basically everything from above except for the dynamic or DOP context. Now, doesn't mean you can't do dynamics because like we learned is you can put dynamics inside a SOP and deliver that as a tool. And as a matter of fact, side effects has delivered a few effects tools in the SOP context. So in actual fact, there is some dynamics within Houdini Core. Uh, for game development, Houdini Core would probably cover a large percentage of the kinds of tasks that a typical studio would want to work with, uh, and then only a few Houdini effects licenses would be needed to uh, handle any effects that you're doing. But again, you could have those people wrap them up in assets, give them to the people working in Houdini Core, and they would be able to um, do everything that you needed to do. Now, we talked earlier about uh, Houdini Engine. Uh, Houdini Engine is basically refers to non-graphical use of Houdini, where you're not using the Houdini interface. So the first example of that is using the plugins for host applications. So Houdini is under the hood, feeding into these host applications. When you do that, instead of calling on a commercial license, you can call on a Houdini Engine license. If you go to the farm with batch processing, you would use a Houdini Engine license. Non-graphical, you're not seeing it, and that allows you to, to not tie up a, a full commercial license. And of course, if you're using PDG or the top nets and they're off doing their thing on the farm, they would they could be pulling on Houdini Engine licenses again to avoid the use of a commercial license. Well, thank you very much. I hope this has been uh, a good introduction to the secret language of Houdini, to the nodes and networks that make up uh, how you work in Houdini, uh, and that you have a better idea of how to, to move forward and uh, add this great application into your day-to-day -day work. Thanks a lot.